Thank you all. We're uh, going to start the second half of our program now. My name is Tori Bosch, and I'm the editor of the Future Tense channel on Slate, where we publish commentary on emerging technologies daily. Um, several of our speakers have had pieces on Bitcoin over the last week, and I encourage you to check them out at slate.com slash future tense. Um, now I'd like to introduce Kashmir Hill, who's going to tell us about her week living on Bitcoin. Kashmir is a senior online editor at Forbes, and as others have said, probably knows more about what Bitcoin means for daily life than just about anybody else. So, thank you. Hello. Um, so as I was, uh, I got here yesterday, I'm based out of San Francisco now, and was unpacking my bags and discovered that um, I'd been in Vegas this weekend and I accidentally kept some of the casino chips from the, the Aria casino there. So I have like $100 in casino chips and I was thinking maybe I can repeat my experiment and try to live only on casino chips for a week in Washington, D.C. Uh, <laughs> But in some ways, I mean, that, you know, Bitcoin is uh, transformative and new, incredibly novel, innovative. But in another way, it's, you know, not that unique. It is um, much like a casino chip, some new kind of medium of exchange, exchange or store of value. Uh, I thought it was interesting. I don't know how many of you are here for the panel this morning, but... Um, Justin Wolfers, the economist, said, well, I don't really respect Bitcoin as an exchange of value because um, I went to get my Bitcoin this morning, or my uh, bagel this morning, and it was only valued in U.S. dollars. And I was like, well, does that mean, you know, pesos aren't a medium of ex exchange, uh, that the euro isn't? Uh, I don't think that's a, a good way to, to kind of gauge its value. Um, but yeah, last year, everybody was writing about Bitcoin because it had it'd been around for four years at that point uh, and had, been, had kind of spikes in its value. It had gone from a few cents to a few dollars to ten dollars. And then at the beginning of last year, it went from um, a few dollars to, to thirteen dollars and people got kind of excited about it. And because they got excited about it, it spiked again and it went to $200. And so you had all these journalists who were writing about how you buy a Bitcoin, um, about their adventures and speculating, uh, if they bought low and sold high. And I thought a better way to explain a kind of complicated concept to people would be just to, to try to live on Bitcoin for a week and see if it had value in that sense. You know, could I survive? Um, could, I, could I live? Could I eat? Could I travel? And um, last year, especially, it was it was really challenging. Um, in San Francisco, there was no way for me to pay for transportation. So on my first day of living on Bitcoin, I had to walk uh, three miles to work through. Uh, I don't know if you know San Francisco, but uh, I had to work walk through the the tenderloin, um, where you'll find Twitter's offices, but you'll also find like a lot of kind of. Um, uh, a, a, a rough, a rough population there. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't a very, a very pleasant walk. Um, and then uh, when it came to buying food, uh, at first I, I couldn't find uh, any options besides a cupcake place in San Francisco that takes Bitcoin and a sushi restaurant. And they were again miles from my office. Uh, so I looked online and I found something called survivalfoods.com and they were selling like these uh, like high, high calorie protein packed uh, uh, bars, granola bars. And so I thought that's what I would have to subsist on for the week. Uh, but then I got lucky and there was a company called foodler.com that had just a month earlier started accepting Bitcoin. And they're essentially like a seamless uh, service so that I was able to order from like almost any food delivery place that was part of Foodler. Uh, so that's, I mean, Foodler is basically the reason why I survived the week. Uh, <laughs> and even with that, I managed to lose five pounds uh, just in a week because, um, because I was walking everywhere, um, eventually riding a bike when I found somebody who was willing to uh, rent me a bike for half a Bitcoin for the week. Uh, and then and then not really eating a lot since I always was having to get it delivered. Um, so when I, I wrote a, a little ebook about it and I was tempted to call it the Bitcoin diet, uh, <laughs> but I wasn't sure who that would appeal to. Um, the other challenge I ran into over the course of the week was 
uh, how I paid for where I lived. Um, and I was renting uh, an apartment from a friend of mine and she was down in Brazil and she was very busy with work that week. And I started emailing her and calling her and sending her a text message every day saying, hey, do you mind if I pay my rent this week in Bitcoin? And she just responded to me. And she's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, if you want, um, just, just pay me later. I, I don't know what this is. And I said, well, you know, I'm doing this journalistic exper um, experiment and I have to abide by the rules I set for myself. She's like, I just really don't understand this. I'm too busy to deal with it. Uh, so I ended up moving out of my apartment for the week. And there were two hostels in San Francisco at that point that were accepting Bitcoin. One was right near my office. I thought it was going to be great. I went to go visit, had like barred metal doors, and there was no desk I could see or get to. There was just a um, like intercom on the outside. And so I pushed the button. I said, hey, do you guys have any vacancies? And they're like, no, go away. And then the other one was in the mission. And it was run by one of the early Bitcoin uh, entrepreneurs, Jared Kenna, who also runs the Trade Hill Exchange, which at that point was shut down because of uh, banking problems. And he said, no, sure, yeah, we can make a space for you. We've got this great, you know, kind of hacker, hostile Bitcoin space. And I thought it sounded great until I got there. And it was still under construction. There were dogs running around the, the uh, hallways. There, they have chicken on the roof on the roof, chickens on the roof, which is, you know, charming, but kind of rustic for the middle of San Francisco. And um, I had one of the, the nicer rooms, but it had this communal bathroom uh, and the showers were just divided by curtains. Anyways, it was a, it was a little rough. So, so last year, you know, Bitcoin living wasn't, it, it wasn't very, it wasn't very easy. Things have changed a lot in the past year. Um, it would be much easier for me to do now. And I may try it again, but I just don't think it would be that challenging because there are so many new merchants who have recognized that accepting Bitcoin is the easiest and freest publicity stunt ever. Um, you know, I could go to a Sacramento Kings game. I could order, you know, furniture, jewelry from Overstock. Um, there is now a gift card service that takes Bitcoin, which would allow me to spend my, my money almost anywhere. Um, back, uh, back in April, May, when I did this, people were still afraid that Bitcoin was going to be declared illegal in the U.S. Uh, and that, again, has changed dramatically. Uh, we had the, the Senate hearings in November um, where regulators and lawmakers and law enforcement agencies said that they feel pretty comfortable with their ability to, to, to regulate and oversee Bitcoin. And that's what kind of sh shot, um, sent the price up um, again dramatically in November, uh, in, in part because China saw the U.S. kind of nodding their head about Bitcoin and decide to start investing. Um, the really weird, the really difficult thing about living on Bitcoin, and it's, a, it's the biggest problem, I think, for Bitcoin generally from a speculative and investment um, standpoint, is its, its dramatic volatility. When I first bought my Bitcoin, for that week, uh, I think it was valued $120. It went up to $140. On my fifth day, it dropped to $90. And, um, and that was the day I decided to buy cupcakes for my brother-in-law's birthday. And so I ended up spending uh, around 0.5 Bitcoin for uh, like a dozen mini cupcakes, which was you know, expensive cupcake prices anyways, already inflated around $45. But now that would be you know, it's gone anywhere from 300 to 500 to 600 dollars that I spent on 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 cupcakes. Um, so <laughs> that's a real challenge for people that want to live on Bitcoin or or just be invested in it. My big takeaway from the week of living on it um, was, I mean, there are a couple of take takeaways. One, the Bitcoin community is really really excited about Bitcoin and super supportive. Um, they they want it to succeed. They were excited about me reporting on it, and people sent me. Bitcoin tips, uh, uh, anonymous Bitcoin tips. And I ended up getting between uh, 10 and 12 Bitcoin over the course of the week, which at the time was about $1,000. Uh, now that would be, you know, anywhere from, uh, I'm trying to calculate whatever the, the current um, value is, but, you know, like $6,000 to $10,000. Uh, and I've never had that happen to me before where somebody was willing to pay me for a story that wasn't, you know, the, the, uh, media publication that that commissioned it um, and uh, 
I ended up just taking everybody in the Bitcoin community that wanted to come out to a sushi dinner at the end of the at the end of the week and um, ended up spending about 10 Bitcoin to buy sushi for about 70 people that showed up. Um, so it was a thousand dollar dinner at the time, and now again anywhere from a six thousand to a ten thousand dollar sushi dinner um, that I gave for these strangers, or that the Bitcoin community <laughs> gave for these strangers. Um, and then um, one thing I discovered then too is how um, how traceable Bitcoin can be. So I had a public address that was associated with my wallet, so that people could see you know how I was spending my Bitcoin over the week, and you could see all of the money that was coming into that wallet uh, later. Uh, uh, Forbes decided to um, test out some of the black markets and see uh, what the customer service would be if you ordered drugs from a black market. And uh, I um, sent money along to help with the purchase of that. Uh, I didn't na make the purchase myself. I just forwarded my money elsewhere. And later it was traceable. I ended up being tied uh, to the, the kind of purchase on, on dark markets. Uh, and so that was the first time that I discovered that Bitcoin was not as anonymous as everybody was saying it was, um, that it is indeed, it is instead pseudonymous. So if you can, um, you can make all of these kinds of purchases and transactions without having them tied to your identity, but if, then if you let your identity slip in some way um, by you know, publicizing your, your Bitcoin address, they can see all uh, many, many of your transactions that are tied to that same address. Um, so one of my takeaways was that uh, the an anon anonymity promises around Bitcoin um, were kind of overhyped. Um, my, my other takeaway was just that um, d Bitcoin's value kind of doesn't matter. It's what we get so excited about in the press because you can talk about it went up to $1,000, it went down to $500. It's a very easy and um, visceral way to think about it. But the more exciting part of Bitcoin is its use as a payment method, um, a, a means for these kind of low transaction fees um, in sending value from one place to another. So you don't have a you know, $60 wire transfer fee when you're trying to send money to another country. And in that way, the, the value of Bitcoin doesn't matter. All that matters is that it's easy to change it from uh, you know, Bitcoin into a regular currency on either end of that uh, transaction. And I think that is probably uh, much more exciting than the ability to um, just kind of you know, buy a cupcake with it or buy sushi with it. Um, uh, so that's what, at the end of it, I, I kind of came away, I started the week as a skeptic and I just thought this was like this weird, uh, you know, Silicon Valley tech geek thing. And by the end of the week, uh, I really saw the potential in it. And I was not surprised that in the year after, Bitcoin attracted so much attention and so, uh, so much in the way of VC dollars. Um, and then the other thing I just think is, is interesting about Bitcoin is the sociological aspect of it. Um, it really is uh, incredible to me that this currency that was you know, created out of thin air is now worth anything from you know, $500 to $1,200. And then you have this community of people that have come around it and supported it and, and really made it into this successful economic meme. And in that way, I think it's just like a, a science fiction novel and it's part of what uh, attracts so much attention to it. Um, it's just kind of this, uh, for all of its science and, and math, it's kind of um, magical in that, uh, in that spread and its ability to grab people's uh, attention and belief. So those were my thoughts after a week of living on Bitcoin. I'm happy to talk to people about it after this.